God determined to establish here a Christian nation. How do I know that? Because we have one. D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. Did you know that Christianity has played the central role in the American experiment? Yet today it's being pushed aside. As citizens, we're going to have to learn to imitate those virtues of Jesus Christ if we're going to prosper and flourish as a nation. Judges have been the agents of this secularization by twisting our Constitution. We need to have a Constitution where the words mean something, and that means, of course, that they don't mean everything. Find out how our Christian foundations have been covered up and what we can do to restore them on today's Truths That Transform. This is Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. For decades now, efforts to secularize America have largely succeeded. Prayer and Bible reading have been virtually banished from our schools, our government institutions, and many of our public places. Much of this change has come through the federal judiciary with unelected judges reshaping the Constitution as it seems best to them. And our society is reaping the tragic harvest. On today's program, we will take a closer look at the far left and how they have successfully used the judiciary to do their bidding. And you will discover how God providentially ensured that America would, in fact, be a Christian nation. As we begin, I had a chance to sit down and talk with Dr. Daniel Dreisbach, professor at American University in Washington, D.C. He is one of America's great scholars on the founding generation, and we discussed how the success of the so-called American experiment depended on its Christian foundation. There are uh, two religion clauses in the First Amendment, and they were there by uh, an act of enormous intentionality on the part of the founders. Why? Why was it important that the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment be so carefully articulated by the founders? Well, I think the pursuit of religious liberty is, is right in the DNA of the American experience. We know, of course, that many settlers, many immigrants were drawn to these uh, shores in pursuit of religious liberty. So this has been an abiding interest in the American experience. And so I think it's, it's part of what it means to, to be an American uh, to, to support uh, the idea of religious liberty. But I think religious liberty is also important to the American founders for a different reason. And that is because they were engaged in a bold and noble experiment in self-government. And there has to be a degree of social order and stability to facilitate self-government. And so one of the great challenges confronted by the founders is how do you promote civic virtue? How do you promote personal morality? And they look to religion and biblical morality to provide that internal moral compass that would prompt Americans to behave in an orderly and decent fashion that will facilitate self-government. And they believe that this is something, uh, these were ideas found in the scripture. And to unleash that influence of religion and biblical morality, they thought it was important to have religious liberty so that uh, moral spokesmen, the church, and people of faith could influence society, could inform the public ethic. So one way to look at that might be to say that these two religion clauses were supports for the foundation that they saw as essential, which is a, a moral and religious and ethical people. That's correct. I'm reminded of uh, George Washington's farewell address. This is his parting advice uh, to the nation in which he says, of all the habits and dispositions which lead to political prosperity, religion 
and morality are indispensable supports. And so Washington believes that if we're going to thrive as a nation, if we are going to be uh, politically uh, self-sufficient, if we're going to be a self-governing people, we have to be a moral people. And religion is the wellspring of that morality. Washington makes a reference to the founder of our religion, making it pretty clear that when he says religion and morality are indispensable supports, by religion he means Christianity. Yes? That certainly is the way I interpret and read it. When Washington uh, re uh, writes his letter in June of 1783, uh, really setting the stage for leaving his position as commander-in-chief, he is giving his parting advice to the nation on what they must do. This fledgling nation, right? We sometimes forget this is a very, very shaky republic, right? Mm -hmm. They have defeated the British, but what's going to happen next? Are they going to hang together and establish a new nation? Are these colonies going to, former colonies going to spin out and create their own nations? Maybe even go to war with each other. There was great uncertainty as to where this group, this ragtag group of former colonies was headed in 1783. And so he gives his parting advice to his fellow countrymen. And in the last paragraph of this speech, which at the time he writes, he thinks this is the last time he's going to be communicating to the American people. Where does he go? He goes to the works of the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. And he says, he says, if we ever hope to be a happy nation, he says, we're going to have to do justice, love mercy, straight from the text of the prophet Micah. And he says, we're going to have to learn to imitate that author of our religion, referencing Jesus Christ and the virtues. As citizens, we're going to have to learn to imitate those virtues of Jesus Christ if we're going to prosper and flourish as a nation. As Dr. Dreisbach explained, the truth and influence of Christianity was a key element in the settling and founding of America. This was something that Dr. Kennedy was particularly passionate about. Joining me now is his daughter and my very dear friend, Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. Jennifer, your dad helped generations of people discover a history they knew nothing about. Yes, he did. And he was saying all of this long before anybody else was. My father knew America's true history, that Christianity motivated those who discovered and settled America and was a key factor in the thought of those who gave us our founding documents. My dad knew that America was a Christian nation, not because everyone was a believer, but because the Christian worldview was essential to everything this nation was built on. From William Bradford to James Madison, there were many brilliant people who had a vital hand in establishing this nation. But who was the most important person in the settling and founding of America? That's a question my father set out to answer in his message, America's Greatest Hero. Here's a portion of that classic message from my dad, Dr. D. James Kennedy. Today, I'd like to talk about America's greatest hero, the one who did more for our freedom, for the establishment of a Christian nation here than anyone else. America's greatest hero is God, the often forgotten one. It probably is rarely recognized at this time of year. But I think you're going to find out that he did more, by far, than any and everyone else. God determined to establish here a Christian nation. How do I know that? Because we have one. And if he had not determined to do that, we would not have such. We could indeed have been a Spanish nation very similar to any one of many in South or Central America. And there was the attempt by Spain to conquer England from which there came the pilgrims and the Puritans and the evangelical gospel that they believed. 
but they were almost conquered. You remember it was 1588 and the invincible armada streamed down the rivers of Spain and out into the Atlantic Ocean and turned northward. The largest armada ever seen before. There was no doubt <laughs> England was toast and God wiggled his toe and a great storm came up and a huge portion of that naval armada sank to the bottom of the sea. The British fleet at that point met them and destroyed much of what was left and they ran the whole rest of the fleet into the western side of Ireland and the invincible armada was not invincible. And therefore we have the kind of nation that we have here today. Well, then there was the fact that we could easily have been French. You may not even know it. The French who were in Canada made a great effort to come and colonize New England under the leadership of de Mont. They made three attempts. The first two, great winds took them out into the ocean. The third one, the wind destroyed their fleet altogether and they went ashore on the treacherous shoals of Cape Cod right about where the pilgrims landed a few years later. They could have met an armed French encampment, but God had other plans in mind. And so at length the pilgrims landed. They were heading for Virginia. There was only one place that they could safely land and that's right where God brought them at first. because. About four years before that, a plague had hit and killed almost every one of them, leaving nothing except the, the bushels of corn that they had gathered before the plague hit, which enabled them to survive that first winter. God, the sovereign ruler of the seas, the winds, the waves, and the storm, brought them here that we might have a strong evangelical Christian nation and that we might go from here to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. As Dr. Kennedy just explained, God is America's greatest hero. And there's much more to be said about God's providential hand on America throughout our history. And we will tell you in a few minutes how you can obtain Dr. Kennedy's whole message from which that excerpt was taken. You may never have heard this history. And part of the reason for that is that our true history has been hidden by those who have used a false interpretation of the Constitution to strip away religion from public life. The federal courts have been the worst offender in this area. How have unelected judges been able to have such a negative influence contrary to the intent of our founders? Our own John Rabe takes a closer look. Well, I think there are a lot of areas in which we have drifted quite a ways from the original intent of the founders. We certainly have a runaway judiciary. Uh, they are now making decisions that have no conceivable relationship to the Constitution. And when judges take it into their own hands, to give the Constitution a different reading from what was originally intended at the time that it was drafted or at the time that it was amended, then what they're really doing is usurping the power of government from the legislative branch, which should be making the laws. Since the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803, it has been accepted that the Supreme Court has the duty to review the constitutionality of laws and government actions. But does that make them the final authority the judicial branch is not the final word of what the Constitution is. The Constitution itself says this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. It doesn't say this Constitution as interpreted by judges is the supreme law. So the Constitution itself 
rejects that proposition. But because the Supreme Court has arrogated so much power to itself to essentially rewrite the Constitution to fit progressive preferences, open seats on the court, like the one just vacated by Justice Anthony Kennedy, are crucial. We've seen the left fail to achieve their goals through the legislati legislative process, but they have through the courts. So the Supreme Court changed the definition of marriage. They legalized abortion to the ninth month, at least until 10 years ago. And so a lot of the, the movement of our country to the left uh, and what a lot of us as cr Christians would, be, would consider in an immoral direction for our country has been accomplished through the courts. This is a serious problem in our courts, and it comes from judges not approaching the Constitution as neutral arbiters, but looking at it as a tool to advance their policy goals. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys. The late Judge Robert Bork was a Yale Law professor and was nominated by President Reagan to the Supreme Court. But those accustomed to imposing a liberal agenda through the courts hotly resisted his vision of applying the Constitution as written and intended, and his nomination touched off the most savage confirmation battle in judicial history. In Robert Bork's America, there is no room at the end for blacks, and no place in the Constitution for women, and in our America, there should be no seat on the Supreme Court for Robert Bork. Because Bob Bork was so well known to be a believer in the Constitution and to be against judicial activism or to practice as the Constitution requires judicial restraint, there were those who decided that they were out to get him. And so they mounted the most bitter, most divisive, uh, most uh, illegitimate attack on a person that had ever been uh, mounted against anyone nominated from the, for the Supreme Court up until that time. Judge Bork's nomination was defeated. Ed Meese was U.S. Attorney General under President Reagan at the time. Uh, that set a low point for the Senate proceedings, but unfortunately it also set a pattern then that was reiterated in subsequent confirmation processes when these same liberal and left-wing organizations got together with some of the uh, ultra-liberal senators in order to stage these same kind of attacks on other people. The attack on Judge Bork was so egregious that his name even became a slang verb in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, defined as to attack or defeat a nominee or candidate for public office unfairly through an organized campaign of harsh public criticism or vilification. Yeah, after Judge Bork was defeated in 1987, um, President Reagan nominated Anthony Kennedy. He was then a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, was considered to be a, a, a safe, reliable Republican. They used different words back then to, to describe judges sometimes, but, um, and he was confirmed unanimously. He, he was confirmed 99 to 0. So um, had Bork been confirmed and appointed instead, um, this would be a very different country. The scurrilous attacks became even more heated and personal against Judge Clarence Thomas in 1991, though he courageously fought back and was narrowly confirmed. This is a case in which this dirt was searched for by staffers of members of this committee, was then leaked to the media, and this committee and this body validated it and displayed it. Because the Supreme Court has been used by the left as essentially a super legislature to institute abortion on demand, same-sex marriage, and other liberal policy goals, they have attempted to control it by using the Bork nomination as the template for subsequent nominations. And they appear poised to try to use it again on President Trump's nominee, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. We are in for a battle. It really has nothing to do with Kavanaugh. Uh, because they were already protesting before they knew who, who it was. If these tactics succeed, if the opponents of Judge Kavanaugh succeed in further politicizing the judiciary, uh, the freedoms that we enjoy and that our system of government is designed to provide are in serious jeopardy. I, I can't overstate that. In our day, there is a virtual constitutional convention underway. Judges are rewriting the document in their own image 
with little regard for the text itself. And the only way to stop this is to get better judges. As former Attorney General Ed Meese just said, it's the job of the Senate to confirm good judges, judges who will interpret and apply the Constitution as written. Well, we have a new resource to share with you that will help you understand how crucial what happens in the United States Senate actually is. Here's our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb to tell us more about it. Jerry, this is an extraordinarily important resource about a piece of our government that's crucial for the survival of the Constitution, yes? Absolutely, because judges are the key, and in fact, there's so many judges that have been nominated, that, but they're being held up in the Senate. And in fact, if uh, the Senate changes in November, those judges might never Be become, yeah. you know, sit on the bench. And our own John Hostetler of the D. James Kennedy Center for Christian Statesmanship, who's such a walking expert on the Constitution and served in the Congress for more than 10 years, he wrote a book called Change the Senate, Change America. He's done so much research on the Constitution and shown that the vice president actually has a lot more power than we realize and can play a positive and pivotal role in this issue. And this resource is available nowhere else. Well, we'll be happy to send you this fascinating new booklet by former Congressman John Hostetler, Change the Senate and Change America, as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877 877- 962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. And Jerry, we have another important resource to go along with this. It's a classic message from Dr. Kennedy. What tell us what it's about? Sure. Well, first of all, we heard a portion of it earlier in the program today, but this is the full sermon and it's called America's Greatest Hero. And he systematically shows how God in effect created America, but even long before America was settled and created and founded and so forth, God was at work even in storms to providentially create this land for the greater good. You know, we've lost so much of our knowledge about America's Christian history. People in many different generations have lost that as a result of the secularizing of our schools and so on, and the secularization of the culture as well. This is a message that's almost a traveling missionary, isn't it? I mean, it brings the knowledge that you really need to have about America to understand what's going on in the world of cultural Marxism and all these other political philosophies that are trying to eject a Christian worldview. You're, it's so true, Frank, and in fact, People risk their lives to come to this country, even to this day, despite all the secularism that, that uh, people are trying to impose on America. You know, look at our national motto, in God we trust. A lot of people might think, what does that have? What is that all about? <laughs> I mean, really, the way the elites try to rule America. But what Dr. Kennedy shows in this message, America's greatest hero, is that God providentially worked in history, even long before Christ in a few instances and uniquely prepared America for great work uh, to bring the gospel, frankly, into all the world. To the world, yeah. Well, we will send you this classic message from Dr. D. James Kennedy, America's Greatest Hero, as well as the new booklet by former Congressman John Hostetler, Change the Senate and Change America. As our thanks for your generous donation of $50 or more, to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. The historical record is clear that Christianity was the key influence on settling and founding America, though many have tried to argue otherwise. 
The founders all knew that the principles of Christianity were not just desirable, but essential to the success of the American experience. As that understanding is being lost today, so is our freedom. But why? Why are Christianity and freedom so inextricably linked? The fact is, we live in a fallen world, with our human sinfulness evident at every turn. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and you and I sin today. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God, according to the Scriptures. And the Bible speaks of that sinfulness as a form of bondage, with unregenerate sinners being slaves to their appetites and selfish desires. God, who is perfectly righteous, cannot, will not tolerate sin in His presence. His righteousness demands that He punish sin. So all sinners have the same problem. They cannot stand before an all-holy God. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came into this world to suffer and die in your place, to pay the penalty for your sins. Yet death could not hold him, and he rose from the grave in victory. To be forgiven and freed from the bondage of your sin, you need only trust in him as Savior and Lord. And let me ask you, have you done that yet? If not, don't put it off another day. Come to him today. Put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. He will free you from the penalty of sin, which is eternal punishment in hell. Instead, giving you heaven and eternal life lived in the presence of God. And he will also free you from the power of sin, unshackling you from the habits and actions that drag you down, enabling you to obey him more and more. As Jesus himself said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Now the sovereignty of God means that He is the sole sovereign in this universe. He is in charge. He is running all things. Whenever the judicial branch seeks to overrule God, it's going to be a concern for me and should be a concern for any Christian since marriage is a divine institution. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.